Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic. And we have a special guest doctor, Today he lives in Indianapolis, is a professional musician, is an educator, and I could say probably he is a professional transcriber. So let me welcome you to the community and to this clinic to Timothy Gondola. Hi, Timothy. Hey, Mirko. Thank you so much for having me. Very glad to be part of the channel. It's a real pleasure to have you here on this uh, episode and as I will explain in a few seconds uh, you have been transcribing a lot in the uh, last few years and your channel on YouTube is hosting a lot of your transcriptions and I'm pretty sure we will have time to talk about it. Uh, you can check Timothy's uh, website, is full of content, full of great educational content and we hopefully can talk a little bit about that. All the links will be in the video description below or some pop-up will come up in the video but I let Timothy introduce himself and talk a little bit about his website and his YouTube channel. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So I've been on YouTube for about seven years, uh, but the specific transcription work that I've been doing, putting out transcriptions consistently, that's been only five years or so. Um, so what I do is I transcribe music, as you guys are all familiar with transcribing. The domain is jazz, um, mostly, and about 99% of what I do is piano. But I've also touched bass. Um, I think I've done some horns, maybe, on my YouTube channel. But most of it is piano, so most people who follow me are also piano players. Um, so I transcribe... And that... And that words yeah. double isn't it because you transcribe two hands <laughs> it, yeah you can call it double um it does get pretty complicated when uh when you have a whole bunch of different elements that complicate things like rhythm um you might have one hand that's comping the other hand is going very quickly or then both hands comping uh, so it takes takes a lot of experience. And then being a pianist myself, I started playing when I was four. I was classically trained. So I have a lot of connection to the instrument that really helps with transcription. That's good. And so can you just talk a little bit about your website? Because I'm not sure I can do a <clears throat> good job. And um, I, I just navigated through your pages and there are a lot of you know good thoughts and and content uh, there is an article on transcribing that is really interesting yeah. so can you elaborate a little bit sure so my website for the longest it was just timothygondola.com and it was just kind of an informal platform i put some of my own music pieces on there and then some links to youtube so youtube has been the main platform of mine but uh, late earlier this year and around august september i redesigned the website rebranded and i actually want the website itself to become my primary platform not just youtube um, so youtube is where i put out transcriptions and through the description boxes people are directed to my website to purchase transcriptions to look at my jazz course that i developed um, 
to commission a transcription. So let's say you wanted something to be transcribed to my contact page on the website. <clears throat> you can get, you can request that. But the website now, my idea is for it to be something that's more than transcriptions. So I have now just a link to my YouTube page, but the new projects I've been working on, like I mentioned, the jazz course, that's been like a year in development, um, basically to to teach jazz piano improvisation for piano specifically uh, from a perspective that I that I see has been lacking um, in my own journey because I came from the classical world. I didn't have any jazz, formal jazz training. It was really all self-taught and through transcriptions. And so I would spend a lot of time looking for courses and tutorials to guide me and teach me. And um, most of what I found would really kind of just show you what to play. Um, so they might they might tell you, okay, here's the two five one chord progression. Here are the modes and the scales that's going to work for the two five one chord progression. Um, and they would show you like little licks or improv lines, and, um, and then that was it. So I would copy and I would know how to play it. <clears throat> but in terms of knowing how to actually come up with that myself, I really felt lost. So the purpose of my course is for not just to know what to play, but to figure out how do you actually create those lines yourself. Um, so there's a lot of self-guided like practice routines, uh, exercises, things like that. So I have the course that I was working on. Um, I also have a blog. So the blog is kind of like a collaborative effort with some other YouTubers as well. And um, the last thing is the notes section, which is just a whole bunch of theory notes and guides and resources like that. That's great. That's that's very good. You guys have to check his website out because it's really great content for everyone uh, at any level. Um, and I think uh, what you said just leads us into the first question, which is, why do you transcribe? Mm -hmm. So I started transcribing in 2013. I went to college from 2011 to 2015 uh, over in Minnesota at McAllister College. And in the middle of my college years, I discovered jazz music in a true sense because I had really very, very little exposure to even hearing jazz, uh, which is a little bit odd, you know, being an American, jazz is pretty popular, but I grew up very focused on classical piano and classical music. Yeah. My dad um, is totally obsessed with classical music. He has the whole collection of Mozart, all of his compositions, it's like 130 CDs. And so that's the world that I grew up in musically, very, very classical piano. Um, and so when I heard jazz piano, it was so different than what I was used to. I was like shocked. Um, I didn't know that you could create this type of music that I was hearing from like Art Tatum, Oscar Peterson. And it was one particular transcription that I found that started me on this journey. And it was uh, Art Tatum's T for Two. And so I heard that. I was blown away. Um, and I've always liked the virtuosic stuff. So when it comes to classical, I would, I really like the Chopin etudes, the Rachmaninoff. And so this was like the jazz version of that. You know, Oscar Peterson and Art Tatum are very musically complex, tons of different harmonies and very fast. And so I was like, I need to play this. <laughs> so I went and I got that PDF and I learned it. Um, and then I looked for Oscar Peterson transcriptions. I found a few. And there was one particular one that I wanted to play that nobody had transcribed. It was called Mirage. And so I decided, well, let me try to transcribe it myself. Um, and so I found New Score. Actually, at that, at that point, I think I was using Finale Notepad. Mm -hmm. I found Finale. Um, and I just pulled up the YouTube video. I slowed it down and I tried just transcribing. It was my first time. Um, and it seems quite impressive that transcription because he's so quick uh, but just a little fun fact 
that transcription was actually a lot simpler to transcribe than, you know, something else that you might hear that you might think would be easier, like something that's a little slower, more rubato, because if you just slow down those those lines, you can really hear the notes clearly one by one, even though they're fast. Yeah. And because it's in, completely in time, it kind of simplifies the process of transcribing. So that was my first transcription. Um, and then I played it myself. And then I wanted to recreate those transcription videos that I saw. So I created a YouTube channel. I put that up there. Yeah. Um, I had an old channel called Pianist for the Win, Pianist FTW. And so I would just post maybe every couple months. And eventually when I decided to really continue transcribing because the interest was growing in the YouTube channel, I created a new YouTube channel. Uh, and then I eventually built the website, timothygonla.com, just to host those transcriptions so people could click on them and download them. So mm -hmm. that was the start of all that. Yeah. So it was like for you a revelation and then you started transcribing because you wanted to see inside the the jazz practice and and maybe you wanted to figure out whether you could do it yourself yes yeah I, I view transcription like it's like a key to unlocking jazz i'm um, specifically jazz because it's improvised right so yeah. in classical you already have the sheet music because jazz is improvised it's very personal and it seems to be inaccessible so um particularly because each person's musical voice is so unique. Like everybody can play uh, Claire de Lune by Debussy. But if, if you asked every jazz musician to improvise that, you know, they would each have their own little version. Yeah. And so it's locked away from you unless you're that person yeah. um, or unless you're extremely skilled already as a jazz musician and you're able to just hear and like copy their style. Yeah. Um, but The, the transcription is like, it's like a life hack. <laughs> it's like a cheat code. You just go straight to be able to play what that person played. Um, and so you're kind of, you're left there. You, you don't know how to come up with it yourself, but it's a wonderful starting point in learning different chord positions, learning uh, the jazz vocabulary that you hopefully would develop yourself in your own learning. Yeah. And you used a very similar wording that another guest of the podcast used, uh, the pianist Paul Grabowski is a great Australian pianist, very well known here in Australia and a real master of the piano. He said to me that uh, transcribing is like hacking a code. <laughs> so. Yeah. He used the, the same words, so th there must be a pianist thing, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but your story is also quite similar to mine to some extent because I come from classical music too. I started as a pianist uh, when I was a little kid, and then when I was about 11, 12, I switched to saxophone, and my father was a saxophone and clarinet player. And he had a lot of vinyls, jazz vinyls, but he locked them away from me because he wanted me to become a classical musician. Because mm. for him, uh, maybe he saw better opportunities for classical saxophone players. Good luck with that. <laughs> mm. And But one day I, I unlock this cabinet Uh, full of vinyls and I remember I took out the first one and was at Blakey and the Jazz Messengers uh, live at Olympia in Paris and there was Benny Golson playing tenor saxophone and I couldn't take the vinyl off the player because it, it was just the first track was Are You Real uh, which was a Benny Golson tune and I just discovered that saxophone could do different things. You know? mm -hmm. And and I it was like getting a virus. I I remember the exact moment and it, I was probably 14, 15, 
so long time ago but i remember the feeling it was like getting you know in your vein and and it's there and so it's similar it's one of those moments where you realize that you are witnessing something um, new something good Mm-hmm. And you want to understand. So if you are a... Yeah, and it's, a, it's amazing when it's when you know that it's improvised. I think, I think that's the aspect yeah. that really just is so um, shocking, especially for classical musicians. When you hear this level, this precision, and especially if there's no mistakes, and to think that they're coming up with this on the spot, it's a very foreign idea for classical musicians that that's yeah that's true very true and when you transcribe timothy what do you expect to bring home like what are your expectation yeah for like the final result of the transcription yeah like what what you hope to gain to achieve oh i see what you're saying um I think it depends on what the context is for the transcription. So because I'm doing it professionally, the vast majority of the transcriptions was initiated by like a customer who requested that. And so in that sense, I'm doing it for them. Um, Some of them will end up on my YouTube channel. So I'm also, you know, conscious, but every single transcription, I like have this motivation to almost make it as perfect as I can. Um, There is no such thing as perfection when it comes to a transcription because there there are parts of a transcription that are not really compatible. So depending on the purpose of what you're aiming for, you're going to be compromising certain things. So I wrote a blog post about that, for example the accuracy of the notes versus the how playable it is for the person. So oftentimes, because I have the audience in mind who are going to end up playing this, I am more leaning towards how can I make this sheet music easy to read, easy to play. Um, So in those instances, I might kind of sacrifice how accurate I'm portraying, like maybe a a complicated rhythm that the pianist did. Um, Now, when it comes to me transcribing for myself, which is not that often, I kind of want to be more precise to what the artist did. Um, So in those instances, I'll be very true to like the rhythm and things like that, um, because I have the, the ability of being able to copy those out, those rhythms, as I'm learning the transcription. Um, so yeah, I think it, de- it depends. And sometimes yeah. I'll just have a piece that I found on YouTube that nobody asked me to transcribe, but I really, I just love it so much that I want to transcribe it and put it up on my YouTube channel. Um, but it's always like... Um, I feel very like happy transcribing, even though it's very difficult because the end result is so meaningful to me, you know, to be able to unlock the music, it just really makes me happy and to do that for other people and be able to, you know, share that work with other people. Yes, absolutely. And you kind of already answered to the next question, but um, I'm going to ask you anyway, um, how do you choose the solo that you transcribe? Now, apart from those ones that you receive as a commission, which clearly mm-hmm. is chosen by the commissioner, um, but when you transcribe something for yourself, uh, do you choose a specific solo or something because you think you want to practice that specific thing or just for the pleasure of I like this track, I want to transcribe it. Mm-hmm. It's usually for the pleasure of it. Um, I know when it comes to other instruments, especially saxophone, you're usually going to end up transcribing like a solo, right? 
Am, am I right about that? I guess yeah. saxophone solo within a piece. Yeah. Now, because the piano is a more, you have two hands, so you can kind of play all of the music yourself if you want to. I gravitate towards like piano solos. Yeah. And by that, I mean like a solo piano performance. So not like a, a solo within a jazz trio or something like that. So a lot of my songs that you'll even find on YouTube, it's just the piano player sitting down and playing an arrangement of something that they came up with with both hands. Yeah. And I like that because then I can play that on the piano. I don't need a bassist. I don't need a drummer to play that uh, that piano solo. They are busy yeah. anyway. So Say again? <laughs> bass players and drummers are busy anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're busy anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then they would have to be able to play exactly what was yeah. in the background of the solo. So, yeah, and I think that's also part of my classical background is you know, as a classical pianist, almost everything you play is just you at the piano. Yeah. You know, unless you're playing like a, a chamber music or something like that. Yeah. And so I can sit down, I can play my Chopin, and then I can pull out a transcription and just play that, you know, so I don't have to rely on the other band instruments. No, it, it makes a lot of sense. And to dive a little bit deeper into your process, uh, what is your methodology when you transcribe? So, hmm. so the process of transcribing, I'm using MuseScore. Um, and I used to use, I used to just sit down at my keyboard and I would copy out whatever I heard and I would, uh, input manually but i've learned how to use the midi uh the midi input from my keyboard so that's started to help <clears throat> but my transcription process is based off of me copying what i heard <clears throat> so i transcribe i'm sorry i listen and then my first goal is to recreate it on the on the keyboard and so once i've recreated it which usually just takes a few moments if it's just a little snippet then I'm going to play it uh, into MuseScore through my keyboard now what I've noticed is over time you know as I've gotten better um, I tend to rely less on the actual piano because I'm able to with the relative pitch that I've discovered I'm able to just kind of figure out you know what the notes are And so sometimes I find myself transcribing and I'm like, you know, I don't even need a piano. I could be at the library right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because it's both hands, you know, I really do rely on that piano a lot of the time. So if I were do transcribing like right hand solos where they're just playing one note at a time, um, I wouldn't necessarily need a piano. But uh, because I'm doing comping, you know, and the two mm -hmm. hands, then you really do mm -hmm. need that piano. Yeah. Um, And do you, yeah. do you like, for example, um, try to learn one phrase or, I don't know, four bars at a time and maybe mm -hmm. sing, sing it back, even if you sing just the right hand or, or you do like note by note or bar by bar? So what I'll usually do is try to get the left hand done. Um, the left hand the left first. Hand, yes, left hand first, most of the time. Because the left hand is like the foundation. You know, it'll have a lot of the bass notes. Um, and once I can pick out that bass note, it's a lot easier to figure out what the chord is that's built on top of it if you're working from the very bottom. So if I hear A, then I know it has to be an A chord, basically, or maybe like A is the suspended note, and then it's a different chord on top, but it, it limits my options versus if I'm starting from the right hand, I have to build from the chord all the way down to the bass note, it would take a little bit longer to figure out what I'm playing. Yeah. So sometimes I'll do the entire left hand for the whole song, which is like a three minute song, and then I'll do the whole right hand. Or I might do... Um, maybe just 
the left hand for one minute and then go back to the right hand and then just do it by chunks. Uh, but once I get towards the end, I like to transcribe both hands at the end and then go back to the, the, to the beginning because it just encourages me once I get to the end to see that I've already transcribed. It's just a little psychological trick. Yeah. 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 That's nice. And so you said you use music score. Uh, do you use any software to slow down or you don't need to? Most of the time I'm just u using the YouTube viewer. So you oh, can okay. slow it down. So to like 75, 75 or 50. Yeah, 75, 50. Yeah. Um, oftentimes I actually don't necessarily need to slow it down if it's not very fast. Now, if it's something that is very quick and very complex, something that would need me to go back a lot, you know, to press pause and then go back and press pause and go back, then I'll extract the MP3 from the YouTube video and use an app called AnyTune, AnyTune Pro. And that allows you to slow down to like 25% or even down to literally 5%. And it keeps the same pitch, which yeah. is a really big advantage because a lot of these slow down, you know, if you slow down too much, it just changes the pitch. Um, and then any tune is good, too, because you have the ability to, you can transpose if you want to. You can loop, um, yeah, you can loop certain sections and things like that. And you can actually cut out certain frequencies. Mm. I usually don't ever need to use any of those kind of extra features yeah. uh, for the transcriptions, but I just like how easy it is to move up and down to, to uh, scrub, as they call it. Yeah. Nice. And you mentioned before, and I'm a little interested in knowing a bit more about it. You mentioned your relative pitch. So you... Yeah. You plead guilty of not having perfect pitch, <laughs> as yes, the majority pitch. of us do. But you said something interesting that sometimes you feel you don't need the piano or you could transcribe parts of, of your solo without even checking mm -hmm. the notes. And that I think it's a common process for people like us that like to transcribe a lot and especially if you focus on one instrument then you your relative pitch on that instrument becomes better and better and better and i used yeah. to tell my students that through the years i might have developed a sort of relative perfect pitch <laughs> which is mm -hmm. a contradiction but uh for example on, on the tenor saxophone 99% of the times I don't need the instrument with me. Only right. I need it only when I don't know the player might play with like fake fingerings or or something, you know, a bit slippery so I need to just make sure that the notes are what I think they are. But mm -hmm. most of the times, especially if I transcribe someone who's playing regular, uh, I could, as an example, maybe Dexter Gordon, I'm confident in saying I won't need to check on the instrument because I know exactly that the high D on the tenor saxophone sounds like that. Yeah. You know, so have you developed a similar skill that yes. even for I imagine the left hand some of the voicings which for me are very hard as a mm -hmm. known you know experienced pianist but maybe for you that have transcribed a lot you hear a sound in the left hand and you know oh that is that voicing exactly yeah oftentimes of when I am at the piano um, I like to say my fingers have perfect pitch <laughs> because I'll I'll hear something and I'll my fingers will know where it is and so sometimes if I'm just listening to jazz at the piano and I kind of want to play along if I absentmindedly just throw my fingers around on the keyboard I might end up playing the exact same chord that I just heard 
and it, it can be kind of spooky because it's like how how did i know that um and this used to happen to me also in my early days of transcribing when i was learning jazz um and i would end up playing different chords that i don't think that i had ever even necessarily learned um but it's like because my fingers have developed this deep connection to the keys it's like over repetition hundreds of thousands of times you know just playing the piano your brain knows finally the the pitch for every note and so um yeah subconsciously i can really quickly connect to the notes um, and that helps a lot and then over time i think what transcription does is it helps bridge between the subconscious and the conscious so subconsciously just as a musician, you've developed a, a deep connection <clears throat> to your notes. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then consciously you want to have the, be, have the ability to have that, that relative pitch where you hear something and you can immediately play. Um, and I think through transcribing, you, you're like bringing those closer and closer together to the point where you can be looking at your instrument and you hear something, and you can know, okay, that's an F. Um, there's another point I wanted to make, too. Just today, I was practicing bass, actually before this uh, interview. And every month, I work on a different piece of bass music where I'm, like, copying the bass line of what I heard. And for all of these months, everything I've done has, has been uh, electric bass. And so I have an electric bass that I'm working with. But for this month, the piece that I want to copy is a, an acoustic bass. And so I found myself a little bit frustrated because it was very difficult to pick out the notes um, when before it was it was easy. You know, I heard this. I'm like, OK, I know that they did this and this and this. But just because the, the timbre was different between the acoustic bass and the electric bass, and I'm not I don't play an acoustic bass. I don't have one. Um, it just was a lot of a longer process to be able to access those notes, even though I could hear it clearly, you know, I could yeah. hear the way the melody was moving, but because I don't have that connection to that instrument, it was difficult for me to be able to, you know, to find those notes on my bass. Yeah. That's very interesting because, uh, I always encourage, you know, my student to, at least start on your instrument but then once you become a little bit more familiar with the whole process of transcribing i encourage them to try to change instrument maybe first to something similar so mm. for example if you play tenor i would say trombone maybe it has a similar sort of yeah. range or if you play soprano try to transcribe a trumpet and you know it's, it's still a wind instrument so uh, mm -hmm. there will be breathing there will be tonguing going on a lot of similarities because if you uh, do your first transcription on your instrument and then you you jump to i don't know hem on organ as a second yeah. you will be in trouble <laughs> most likely i mean yeah. not everyone but you know it's harder because it's not your instrument you are not familiar with the sound exactly what you said what you described it was and even for me as a keyboardist when i've tried to transcribe organ i find it quite challenging yeah it's I, so different from piano you know so there is we could probably state that there is a, a chance to become perfect pitch depending on the timbre on the instrument. So it's a perfect mm -hmm. timbre pitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've heard that type of idea. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody was talking about that type of, I think they called it true pitch where for saxophone specifically, I think it's a YouTuber called Saxologic uh, was talking about if you don't have perfect pitch and you might not even have relative pitch, but through playing your instrument, you associate the, 
the tone of each specific note with that note. And so in that sense, like if you hear that instrument play a note, you know what that note is because you're used to hearing that specific timbre. And so that type of um, that type of relative perfect pitch that you call it, I think it might be a little easier with instruments that have a very distinct tone, you know, as you're moving up and down the range, like saxophones, yeah. wind and uh, brass, maybe even probably a little bit more difficult for piano. But um, I think over time, you know, if you play anything for long enough, you, you have such a connection to it that you're going to develop that type yeah. of ability. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking that also, you know, sometimes you transcribe a few solos from the same player and then mm -hmm. you start recognizing the most frequent patterns or the most frequent yeah. ideas used mm -hmm. uh, and also the most frequent rhythms because sometimes rhythm can be difficult. You know, the notes are relatively easy, uh, but sometimes rhythm can become challenging if you transcribe a ballad. Uh, mm -hmm. Putting down the rhythm can be really <laughs> overwhelming, but if you start transcribing a lot the same player, or I would also maybe say the same style or period in the jazz mm -hmm. music, you know, where everyone was trying to sound like, you know, the same people in the right. same age group. Uh, it can become a little bit easier because our ears, I think, are really good in catching repetition and when an idea is presented multiple times, uh, our ears pick them up immediately. Mm -hmm. And then once you, you worked on, on the first one, then you say, oh, I know this, because I have already, you know, spent five minutes trying to get it. And just a, a curiosity, Timothy, um, you know that uh, Naples in Italy is a quite peculiar city, I would say, where creativity in the general people is at the top. I think it's the top in the world. People mm. in Naples are the most creative uh, people in the world. Uh, and saxophone players that are trained in Naples, they learn saxophone in concert pitch. Okay. Which is a bit of a drag if you play different saxophones, because then you will have to learn two different fingerings. Right? I, I play tenor in B-flat and I play alto in E-flat. So for me, this fingering is always C, mm. right? But okay. f for, a, for a guy in Naples, this is E-flat on the alto or is B-flat on the tenor. Yeah, that's interesting. It's very interesting. And I discovered that because I was studying in a, in a jazz school and I did a little arrangement for a small ensemble and there was a saxophone player from Naples and I gave him the chart transposed in E flat and he said, sorry, I can't read it. I yeah. said, why it's transposed? No, I, I, I play in concert. And it's so fascinating. Um, the explanation I was given is that they don't want to deal with the transposition and faking your ears to force your ears to hear something that is not true, mm. right? So they want to hear E flat and they have to know where the true okay. E flat is on the instrument. What do you think about that? Like, I think, it's, but, I think yeah. it's fascinating, uh, but as a very lazy person, <laughs> I'm happy with transposing on the chart, yeah. on the paper, but it's fascinating because they will relate 
to true sound and to the actual frequencies. And mm -hmm. some sometimes, you know, when I play the piano and when I compose music, I just use the piano. I have never written a song on the on the saxophone. Uh, just because the temptation of having the bass and the harmony mm -hmm. at the same time is, is too strong. Uh, but sometimes I decide uh, the key based on the piano, how that melody sounds on the piano. And I might say, oh, uh, E flat is really good. But then I go to play on the saxophone and it becomes F and it changes. You know, so I started playing E flat on the saxophone and I said, oh, it sounds better. So it means that we need to play in concert D flat, right? Yeah. And so my friend from Naples, they won't have that issue. Uh, and they will train their ears to recognize the actual frequencies, which is, I don't know, probably a small detail, but I can understand the logic. Mm -hmm. I simply won't be able to, you know, spend years relearning uh, the saxophone because it's too convenient. Yeah. You learn one fingering and you play seven saxophones. Yeah. I will tell you, uh, this sounds a little bit of a similar idea. Uh, if I'm playing on a keyboard, an electric keyboard, and it's been transposed, yeah, it's like I immediately know something's off, um, um, and I have to like figure out how to get it back in. I guess what you would call concert pitch. Yeah, uh, and so I actually find that I very much struggle to play in a transposed key on the keyboard. So if the the whole keys are shifted um, because it's like something is not lining up in my brain. If if my brain knows that this should sound like a C chord, but I'm actually playing D or E or D flat, it's just, it's very difficult. Um, and uh, so, so sometimes I've been in a gig where somebody just said, uh, oh, why don't you just, you know, transpose this? Um, but let's say it's a singer who wanted to change the key real quick. So I just play the transpose button, you know, and I'm like, no, nah, it just doesn't work that way. I can't just, I can't just no. transpose. Yeah. I have to be able to play it in the original key, um, or else it just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I understand perfectly what mm -hmm. you are saying. And, uh, do you practice your transcriptions? Like if you do one transcription for your own leisure, then do you have a process where you actually start practicing and how you do it? Um, oftentimes, um, my favorite transcriptions, I'll, I'll play them and learn them and practice them. Uh, so, for example, my latest one is Jamar Jones playing Ode to Joy. And I've been, as soon as I transcribed that, I, I immediately went to start playing it because it's, it's just amazing. It's one of my favorite uh, transcriptions. Now, I've always been very good at sight reading um, mm -hmm. ever since my classical days because I would, I would be very good at learning new pieces and not that great at mastering them to the frustration of my piano teacher. I would just love just learning new materials. And so I would I would play this and that and this and that. And I would get to like 90, 95% mastering the song. And at that point, it's like, if you spend five hours practicing, it's a little bit of an improvement versus if I spent that five hours starting a new song, I might almost master it in five hours. So <laughs> it was like a cost benefit analysis. Um, so between that, the very good sight reading and then working on a piece to transcribe it, you become so accustomed to every bit of that transcription. So once I've transcribed something and I want to play it, I usually barely even have to practice it unless it's very complicated. So I can just kind of sit down and just play it out basically. Um, yeah, some of my favorites to play 
that one. Um, I really like the Chick Corea transcriptions I've done, uh, the Oscar Peterson ones. Now, those I do have to sit down and pra practice because they're just too fast, too complicated. But, yeah. And do you, again, do you practice in a classical way? Like you take a phrase, you repeat over and over and over, or you practice with the with the actual track in the background and play along? Um, I've never practiced with the track because I feel like that would be actually a roadblock to playing it well because that pianist had, um, they were playing from a certain type of like attitude or like feeling spirit that they felt at that time that you can only feel once, even themselves, if they were to play that same thing again, it would be different. So it's better to just try to play it yourself. But I do apply a lot of the classical practicing techniques. So like with the Oscar Peterson, um, I might use like an accent displacement exercises um, to get good at playing, playing those runs pretty fast. Um, yeah, sometimes I'll drop one hand you know, just parts of the left hand by itself or right hand by itself or do little snippets, things like that. That's good. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. Do you ever sing your transcriptions? No, I would say, first of all, I'm not a good singer. So maybe if I was a better singer, I would be inclined to do that. But... Um, I guess it would be a little bit different if it's piano because you have so many notes and it, chords and things like that. It might be a little bit easier for saxophone, but no, I don't find myself singing them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's quite common for saxophone players to, or at least, I don't know, for me, and I encourage a lot of people to do that, to learn the solo by singing it. Mm. and I've done like three or four there are three or four solos that I can still remember and I can sing from top to the end and then if, if I want to mm. really okay. ch challenge myself I just sing with a metronome so that means that I have learned it right if I can sing it with, a, with just the metronome without hearing the context again uh it means that i have you know a, a given myself enough time to absorb uh there is a stanget solo that i can i can actually sing the whole track is wow. is yeah he is is his solo on, on stella by starlight uh, in his first solo album as a soloist uh, called Stan Getz Plays mm -hmm. and it's an album where basically there's there's just him playing the the guitar or the piano they just play in the introduction and then Stan Getz plays the melody the solo the head out and the coda and that's it so it was good because the saxophone always plays so I could yeah. memorize the, the whole thing and it's really helpful for us for example to understand breathing which for mm -hmm. us it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a big component you know and if I want to learn a transcription I need to breathe in the same spots because otherwise I could be caught in the middle of a very long phrase <laughs> running out of oxygens and I fail because if I have yeah. to breathe and there are still some notes, it means that I didn't do it right before. So it, it was that, yeah. the breathing and yeah, and the singing. Yeah. And uh, do you have a specific methodology again uh, to incorporate? ideas from the transcriptions that you make into your own playing or mm -hmm. sometimes you know we just leave it there and we wait for those ideas yeah. to eventually 
come up again? That's a good question. Um, I wanted to add one last point to your previous question. So now that I think about it, I don't sing, but <clears throat> as you were as you were talking, I was like in my own brain, I was humming some solos, you know. And so some of the things that I've transcribed in my head, I can play the whole thing. Like I guess, and I guess I could sing it out loud if I wanted to, and be able to do that. It's never something that I've consciously tried to do, but just yeah. through enjoying the music and then uh, transcribing it, I just and listening to it so many times, I just picked it up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but your next question. Was the next about, question is about, if if you adopt some strategies to incorporate. <laughs> some mm -hmm. ideas into your playing i don't know i give you an example you like one phrase or or a lick and you take it out you practice in 12 keys or yeah. any other thing that you do if you do something yeah um i should be doing more of it i do a little bit sometimes so i might isolate a lick that i like a lot and um I've created a couple of lick videos uh, on my YouTube channel. They're called Inside the Mind Of. So it's a series as I've done Bill Evans and Oscar Peterson, where I looked through some of my own transcriptions and then also some others I found on YouTube. I found some licks that I really liked. I isolated them. I uh, copied and pasted them over a 251 harmony or whatever other harmony is being played. And I think in the case of both, I played it in multiple keys. Uh, and then the, the product that I'm selling is I've transposed it to, into all 12 keys. Yeah. And so some of those I would go and, you know, practice in all 12 keys. Um, sometimes I think what I, what I get from transcriptions as well is certain chord progressions. So sometimes I'll find... Like there's a Terrence Scheider piece. I think maybe it's a, I just called to say I love you by Stevie Wonder. Mm -hmm. He does this amazing progression. That's like unexpected. It's two, two, five ones, but it's like the order that he chose is really interesting. And then it resolves to this different, to like the five. And so I'll take that chord progression and I'll just practice it. So basically me coming up with my own, uh, my own chords for that and then I'll I'll learn how I can plug that into something completely different um, yeah. and then in other cases I'll learn maybe like as you can call it a lick like a long continuous lick that can be played over maybe even a different chord than what the original chord is so there's this one Oscar Peterson line where he's outlining a a uh, minor G chord, I think it's a minor 7, G minor 7. And uh, the way he's outlining it, he's also hitting the major 7. So he's making it like a minor major. And um, that, I've learned to transpose that in the different keys. But I think you can also take that and play it in the relatives. So basically, whatever you find in a minor key, you can apply that to a relative major and vice versa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just realized very recently i'm i'm working on a wonderful solo play by chris potter on all the things you are with uh, shy maestro it's mm -hmm. a duet yeah, and oh shy maybe you, you should transcribe the piano and then <laughs> we play together <laughs> yeah. the, the transcription uh it's a wonderful wonderful track in itself but uh, Chris Potter of course is doing Chris Potter so he's playing a lot of great ideas and and there is a, a in the middle of probably the third or the fourth chorus he's starting using a lot of wide intervals like major sevens or nines and hitting yeah. very high pitch notes and after a couple of days that I transcribed that, I went to play on a gig and I found myself like playing uh, yeah. more than, than usual 
on wide intervals and hitting. So I guess because we spend a lot of time trying to get it right and we listen to a lot of time and then we feel, oh, that's great, that's that's a great idea. That even unconsciously, but we start, you know, processing those informations and then you go to play and sometimes they come back after a few months but just recently it just came back the day after like i transcribed yeah. then and i i felt it i said oh this is <laughs> where it comes from and yeah that's an amazing ability uh i don't know it is usually it takes it takes longer and i need to practice more it doesn't happen that that quick, but because I was even recording uh, the transcription process, because sometimes on my channel I not only publish transcriptions or the interview, but I also do some live transcriptions where mm. you can see myself doing and I explain how I do it. And and I'm very excited about that solo because it's, it's just fantastic and the relationship between the two players is unbelievable. They click in half a second and they take the same direction. And yeah. Shai Maestro is great. He's, he's changing the harmony. He's molding the harmony, adapting to the situation. And it's, it's really <laughs> great. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can add there too. So oftentimes I will also try to adapt the like the feeling of what's being played. So the way that actually ends up working is maybe the rhythm or the pulse that the that I hear or that I've transcribed, then maybe I can recreate using different notes, that same rhythm, or maybe it's like a movement of chords down this way. And then I might find myself, if I'm playing, you know, improvising, all of a sudden I, I do a similar type of thing. So it's not no for no what was transcribed, but yeah. I kind of picked up on the, the rhythm or the feeling, you know. Absolutely. And who was the most difficult player that you transcribed? Mm, most difficult player? The one that gave you, yeah. you know, more troubles. So, it's actually not Oscar Peterson. <laughs> A lot of people would think that. Um, he actually, like I said, he's easier than you would think because he tends to have his notes be continuous. Um, I would probably say Chick Corea. Um, it would be between Chick Corea, Johnny Costa, or another guy I transcribed called Gerald Clayton. If, oh, I had to yeah. choose one, if I had to choose one, I would go with Chick Corea. Yeah. Um, yeah, some of those have taken me so many hours. Because the thing about Chick Corea is when you hear him, he is so integrated into the music that you don't necessarily hear that the rhythm is strange. But as soon as you go to transcribe, things are not lining up with your 4-4 four, four measures and and your triplets are not, you know, like he didn't play, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so you, I have to find ways of working around. Sometimes I have to add little extra beats in the measures or come up with these crazy like subdivisions like 11-8 uh, or something. Um, to be able to accurately portray what he played. And that always surprises me because when you hear it, it sounds so natural. Yeah. But, um, and that's because he is, that's really the nature of improvisation. In his mind, he's not thinking of playing some very complex rhythm. He's just maybe trying to hit a certain amount of notes within a certain amount of time to reach a, a target note. I guess we can say those players use the space in a different way. So I remember a lecture from Joe Lovano saying that, you know, when you play even a medium up uh, tempo, 
instead of thinking one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you can think one, two, three, four, or even one, two, three, four, or even mm -hmm. one, two, three, four. But the tempo is still there. So in, in that case, you use the space and instead of having four beats, you have one container, mm -hmm. one bar is one container and you can move inside. It doesn't really matter whether you play precisely eight notes or quavers or semi quavers. You can play, you know, like a, a sheet yeah. of notes and adapt them to stay within the container, the box, and then <laughs> makes really Brilliant. hard for us, you know, to get it down on, on a piece of paper. Like, yeah, this solo that I'm transcribing, there is a part where I had to compromise a lot because Chris Potter is playing, is shredding, you know, over the bridge and he's playing like seven tuplets, nine tuplets and fifth tuplets and 11 tuplets. So mm. I just count the notes and more or less try to determine where yeah. it starts and where it ends. And then if it's 11, it means it's 11 over two beats. Okay. Exactly. I, I get it. Yeah. And yeah. that's brilliant. What you said about the, I thought in that way, but I never took it that deeply. Um, when you said you can think of it in terms of one or one, you know, and it grows yeah. bigger. That's Joe Lovano. That, yeah. Joe Lovano. That's so if you play a triplet in like a very large scale, that would be very hard to transcribe <clears throat> and it would look very strange. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I tried to practice with uh, the metronome very slow, like really, really slow, like a metronome at 20 mm. and the metronome, I think at the metronome that is only on beat two. So it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, oh, wow. four, one. That sounds difficult. Two. It is difficult, but uh, it's a great exercise to start feeling the, the space instead of the beat. So you start feeling the breath <coughs> of a bar and you don't feel any more all the beats so that you are tempted to play all the time. Yeah. And I usually I start with just playing a scale and try to meet the metronome. So like do da di da do da di da di da. So you're saying that helps you in terms of your rhythm and your Tone? What exactly? It helps that? me to uh, control my time better yeah. and to use the space in a better way. So I will play less. Uh, I, I will play a wider variety of rhythms and mm -hmm. rhythmic ideas because I feel the space rather than one beat. Right. Is if you if you think beats, well, you can have two notes, one note, three notes, four notes, five notes, but you always think beat by beat. Mm -hmm. So it can be ta ta ti ta ta ti ta ta ti ta ta ti ta 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 ti ta 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 ti ta 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 ti ta 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 ti. But everything will be precise, precise, and related to one single beat. But if I think one bar, I can play as we said, 11 notes, and I'm not thinking at what rhythm I'm playing. I'm just playing mm. a line. I follow the horizontality of my idea and I place the notes wherever I feel they, they go without thinking too much of... Very interesting. Yeah. Am I on beat three or beat four? No, I'm... 
I'm filling in a box. So I, I feel a, a bit freer. But I, I grabbed that idea from, from Joe Lovano and, and it worked. And sometimes even, you know, do weird experiments like playing a blues in 3-4. Yeah. And the metronome is on beat two at twenty BPM. And I start yeah. improvising with just a metronome and first of course I want to stay simple and then once I get in and I start feeling a little bit more natural I try to make my lines a little bit more interesting. But it's super challenging. You know, most of the times yeah, it takes you. me 10 15 minutes just to start feeling that I can control it mm. otherwise it, it's so easy to lose it because it's it's too easy when you hear all the beats right but when you <laughs> hear only yeah. one beat and the tempo is so slow it becomes difficult but there is a way that we can learn and as I said, if you if you insist doing it, you start feeling, and then and then you feel nice because you feel that yeah, you yeah. can move things around without being compelled to play, you know. And so when when we think bit by bit, it's like the box is this big, and you can't you don't have space. You just put yeah couple of things and then you move on to the next box but when the box is this it's better and when the box is this it's even better right yeah i've stumbled upon through transcribing certain instances where the person is playing something that's impossible to to transcribe rhythm wise i don't know if, it, if that's just muse score or maybe sibelius has this option but let's say you do a triplet. Let's say you're in four four, yeah, and you're on the and of four, and you're starting a triplet that covers two beats on the and of four, and so it starts there, and then it goes to the end of two of the next measure. Um, very artistically interesting, but makes my job very frustrating because there's no way for me to transcribe that. Um, so I might end up doing doing something a little bit different and then I might write uh, I use these two expressions ahead of the beat or behind the beat yeah. meaning that they're just kind of maybe slightly they're playing the notes but everything is kind of shifted a little bit earlier hmm. um, but like to your point if you're thinking in terms of a bigger margin you could throw that triplet in and it and it would kind of make sense it wouldn't break any boundaries of rhythm yeah I think, yeah, I think with Sibelius or Finale or Dorico, those are professional notation software, and I think it should be possible to put the triplets wherever you want, because you can mm -hmm. always readjust the beaming in the mm -hmm. way you want, so it should be possible. Um, otherwise, you have to go back to the you know, Mesozoic and write on paper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Timothy, last question, which is the silly ones. Um, which one is your favorite solo? So if you are going to the desert island and you can only bring one transcription, which yeah. eventually will save your life, which one <laughs> it is? Um, it would probably be the one that I've played the most consistently and frequently. I'd have to say probably uh, Love Castle by Chick Corea. Mm -hmm. I always go to that one. It's the probably the longest transcription I've done, seven minutes. Wow. And the most complex in terms of, not the complexity necessarily, but how how many different textures and colors and things. So it covers a wide array. There's quick passages, slow, there's like classical type of genre, uh, jazz, 
modern jazz, um, free jazz at the beginning. And so I've often, as I'm playing that one, I branch off myself into different directions and kind of use the transcription as a, like as a launch pad for my own improvisation. And so I feel like that would afford me the most freedom. I could make the most out of that one. Yeah. That's good. It's a nice one. Mm -hmm. So Timothy, thanks a lot for your uh, generosity of your time. I'm pretty sure the viewers will have a lot of fun listening to your points and your artistry. And as I said at the beginning of the episode, all the links uh, will be in the video description. And please check uh, Gondola Music out because it's really a, a good journey that you can have inside the musical world. And thanks for being our guest doctor today. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've learned a lot. And thanks to all the viewers for staying uh, with us today, please drop a comment if you like, and see you next time. Bye-bye.